mean, can you imagine driving in a hydraulic car? tunes we need to be having playing on our radio right there. Appreciate the group and uh, our God is an awesome God. He absolutely is. And uh, just thankful that we can be in worship this morning uh, to be able to worship our awesome God in incredible ways. Let's have a word of prayer as we continue and then we'll, uh, we'll continue with our lesson. Father, thank you so much for giving us life and breath and everything else. And God, just thank you for bringing us to church. Whether we've been a member of your kingdom for many, many years, or perhaps we're here for the very first time. We know that you love us, as two we preached about. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for looking out after us. Thank you for being patient with us and giving us the freedom to choose whether we want to follow you or not. And we're here today because we're showing signs, God, of wanting to. We're showing a heart and mind and even behavior to express, we, we do want to know about you, we want to follow you, we want to know more about your teachings, we want to apply these things to our life, we want to learn about the Bible, we want to do what's right. And Father, we know that you won't disappoint. You continue to reach out to us, you continue to pull us in. You continue to bring us home. And, and Father, as we look at your word, help us to see how all the things that are written are for our benefit. It's for us to know you more, to declare our love for you, to be different people, and to also make a difference in this world. Thank you for our worship. Thank you that we can have the freedom to do this together as a church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Earlier this week, a few of us went and saw the movie War Room. And by, yeah, by, by some of your reactions, you've seen it, or you're really excited to go see it. Uh, I really recommend uh, going and seeing this movie. You know, on Rotten Tomatoes, it gets like a 38%. It's a splashed tomato. You know, the world doesn't appreciate movies like that. Uh, but see it as a family. Uh, go, go see it. It's, it's a great inspirational movie about our relationship with God, about marriage, about family, about priorities. Um, several times I, I cried during the movie. And I don't like crying during the movie because, you know, you, you try to be macho and you try to you know, you know, you know, hide it here. Or... Every time Son cries in movies, I always look at her, too. I just want to see, see if she's crying. And then she looks back at me. And... Uh, but there's, there are many times where you, you're just compelled to cry because you're so moved in your heart and mind. Uh, in a world that throws so many different challenges and pressures in our life, we, we need constant affirmation and confirmation from God about what we're doing as followers of Christ. So I recommend you go see that movie. I hope even one point our, our family groups, our Ahana groups are able to view that movie together and even discuss it. It will, it will help and inspire your relationship. God. If, you're, if you're here for the very first time too, I'm really thankful that you're, you're coming out. I really believe that God has brought you here uh, through perhaps interactions with, with people of the church or an event in your life. Uh, perhaps you realize, I, I, need, I need God. I'm looking for God. I need some help. Maybe, maybe you're new for the first time. You're starting out reading the Bible. And that's okay. You've got you to gotta start at the right place, and that's in God's fellowship. Uh, thankful that you're here, and, and, and if you are coming out and you're, you're, you're checking out the church, you're checking out God's church, I, I, hope, I hope you make this church your home church. I hope you uh, get encouraged, and I hope you get some strength and encouragement from the fellowship that God is providing you here. You, you'll quickly find out that we believe in, in one God. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is our Savior. We cannot save ourselves, but Jesus is our one and only Savior. We believe in the Bible. We believe in the Bible's plan of salvation and how we can become saved in God's eyes according to the Scriptures. We're a fellowship of Christians. We're not perfect people. Far from it. Just ask our spouses if you're married. We're far from being perfect. Just ask our kids if you're a parent. We're far from being perfect. But you know what? God gives us the ability to repent, change, uh, to, to do, do again, to do what's right, and uh, to live faithfully and love Him in every way. We're going to be starting a, a series of lessons, and, and 
really why we're doing this series of lessons is because we know that not only if you've been a member for a long time, we need to be reminded of some basic fundamental teachings from God's Word. But we know that many new people are starting to come out to church, and it may be the very first time that they're even reading these words and looking at some of the teachings of Jesus. But we're starting a series of lessons called Red Letters. Find yourself in the words of Jesus. And why red letters? Well, there is a very popular edition of, of the Bibles that are out today. It's called the Red Letter Edition. And uh, you, may, you may wonder, well, that's probably the way it's been for all of eternity since the Bible has come into print. Well, that's, that's not necessarily so. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little history of, of the red letter, and then what we're going to do is just give an overview of the parables today, and then I'm going to give you instructions to go read the parables uh, uh, as you do your own homework. But uh, no, the first red letter edition of the, the New Testament came out in 1899, so it wasn't the first, uh, it wasn't how the Bible was written. Actually, the Bible wasn't written where you had chapter numbers and verses, it was just one one long, not run on sentence, but it was one long uh, scroll. And this idea of red letters came about by uh, a man by the name of Lewis Cott, or Cloth. He was an editor of a Christian Herald magazine, and his desire was he just wanted people to know the teachings of Christ, specifically the teachings of Jesus Christ. And the red letter edition came about from a passage he read in Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And it simply says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And this was the, the verse that Lewis thought, okay, I, I want to start printing the words of Jesus in red because his blood is red. And that's the only, that's, that's how it originated, a red letter edition. And with many teams of scholars... Uh, this, this edition is very popular even today. Maybe your Bible has a red letter edition where you see the New Testament and some parts of the Old Testament. You see the words of God, words of Christ in red. It, it makes it easy to stand out. It, it definitely helps when you're looking up Bible passages and you can easily track where the, the, the message of Jesus is being spoken. But it's popular even today. And, and this is our goal. As we read the red letters, specifically the parables of Jesus Christ. As, as we read these letters, it is our goal that we find ourselves in the passages of the Bible. We get to identify who we are. We get to see how Jesus even views us and what God wants us to be able to do in our lives. That is our goal with the series. I mean, do you know what a parable is? If you were to describe to your neighbor right next to you, now, do you know what a parable is? How would you describe a parable? What is a parable? Well, it comes from the, the word that means to place beside, to throw alongside. In other words, a parable is a, a comparison. It's an analogy. It's a story. One good definition that I've heard what a parable is, it's an earthly story with a heavenly spiritual meaning. That's a great definition. It's an earthly story with a heavenly spiritual meaning. For example, uh, Aesop's Fables. Have you guys ever heard of Aesop's Fables? Uh, there are scores of them. Uh, scores of Aesop's Fables. So things like uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing. You ever heard of that one before? Uh, where, where, where appearances may be deceiving. When you have people come in, 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 in sheep's clothing, so to speak. Here's another one. The tortoise and the hare. Remember that one? Slow and steady wins the race. The lion and the mouse. That's another one. Little friends may become great friends. And, and these are... I, I can tell by your look. You don't remember these fables. I can tell. But you've probably heard of Aesop before. Okay, you've probably heard of him before, and, and I'm, I'm jarring your memory, whether, whether you've heard him before or not. But these are, these are just good children's stories that have a moral behind it. And in many ways, a spiritual way, that's what a parable is. A parable is like a, a fable that also has moral story behind it. But here's the difference. 
Fables aren't real. Parables are. The parables of Jesus are based on truth and have true morality going on. And so it's important for us to even understand that, what a parable is. It's a story. Jesus was the best storyteller of them all. He absolutely told the best stories. And Jesus was that man. Now, how does the Bible introduce the parables uh, that we find? Now, I don't know if you realize that there are parables found in the Old Testament. I've just listed a couple here for your own reference. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 through 7, the Bible talks about a vineyard, God's building, and how God is disappointed with His building, the people of God, and that there's judgment that's coming upon Israel. That is a, an Old Testament parable we find. Another parable that may be a little bit more popular uh, that we're, we know of is in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 through 7. This is when the prophet Nathan gave King David a parable how a rich man took the only sheep of a, a, a very poor neighbor. And Nathan later told David, you are the man. And this was a, an indictment of David uh, having committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then David says, I, I have sinned against the Lord. He finally came to the conviction. But Nathan the prophet had to give him a parable to help him connect with the principle. He had to give him a story to help him. So we have parables found in the Old Testament. We also have parables in the New Testament. There are over 40 parables of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, it was estimated that at least one third of all of Jesus' recording teachings was found in the parables. So if, if Jesus' teachings were, were in, a, in a good way, taught in parables, don't you think it's important that you get to know these parables too? Don't you think it's important, if Jesus thought it was this important, that you learn the parables, you master the parables, you apply them to your life, you know them, you can tell these stories more than you can say, you know, uh, Goldilocks and the... How many bears? Three? Three bears? Three little pigs. Remember that story? We can tell that story too, but prayerfully, we're going to get to the point where we can say the parables better than those fables growing up. And we can have them on our hearts and have them in our minds. Now, for some of you, you are very familiar with the parables. You've read them many times, and that's great. For others, this may be the first time you've actually set your eyes on the parables. And you're, you're learning it for the very first time. Regardless of your starting point, God cares not only about our knowledge of them, but He cares about our practice and our heart behind it. That's what God wants. If, if we don't act upon the principles of God, then it's meaningless for our lives. And that's why it's important that each and every one of us, we, we continue to be great students of the Bible. Whether we've read something many times or whether we're reading it for the very first time. Jesus said enough parables to get our attention. Now, one passage in the New Testament. Let's look over in Matthew chapter 13. One passage that describes the purpose of the parable is found in, in this uh, passage of Scripture. And so we'll read Matthew chapter 13. And then I want to read it again in another version. But we find the purpose of the parable and even why Jesus told these stories. Let's start in verse 10. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? Jesus replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more. They will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. That's why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they don't see. Though hearing, they don't hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them.
But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Jesus goes on to explain to his disciples why he, he spoke so many stories to the people. It was for the purpose of them understanding spiritual, heavenly meanings connected with an earthly story. It, it made it connectable and relatable to the people of his audience. And there's a lot here that Jesus talks about and what parables will do upon people receiving it and hearing it. And there will be a lot of, of response and reaction to the stories that Jesus even communicates. I wanted to read it in the Message Bible. I'll have it up on the screen here. But let's take a look and give us a little bit more insight perhaps on how to view some of these principles. In the Message Bible, in verse 10, it says, The disciples came up and asked, Why do you tell stories? Jesus replied, You've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight. It hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone has a ready heart for this, the insights and understandings flow freely. See, when, when someone comes to God and they're ready, they've got a prepared heart, they're ready to learn from Him, they're, they're put in a position where they're humble, they're, they're wanting to approach God. They're ready. They're ready to receive His teachings. They're ready to learn from Him. If, if you're in that position, then guess what? Insights and understandings are going to start flowing. The Bible, when you read it, it's actually going to start popping up out of the pages. And you're going, wow, I didn't know that, that was in there. Wow, that talks about me. That talks about my family. That talks about my, my present situation. When you have a ready heart, that's what starts happening. God gives you understanding and insights and they start flowing. But, if there's no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. And that's the opposite. Someone, someone who doesn't have a ready heart, guess what? They, they might hear it, but they don't really listen. They might see it, but they really mm, don't want to make the changes right now. See, God predicted that this would happen. Because not, not everyone who hears or sees the gospel of Jesus is going to respond favorably. Right. Or at the same time. Or at the right time. Or at the time we desire. It all has to do with the heart. It all has to do with our hearts and how prepared and ready you may be for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I tell stories. To create readiness. To nudge the people toward receptive insight. This is what we do at church. This is what we do in our groups. We encourage each other. We nudge each other. That's what the Word does. It's not based on our feelings or opinions, but God's Word ministers to all of us. And God speaks to us Nudging us, empowering us, giving us hope that, hey, it's going to make a difference if we're ready, if we've got a ready heart. Do you have a ready heart today? Are you ready? Are you receptive? Are you open to God? Uh, not, not just religiously, not just, you know, you're good at going to church, but are you, are you open to changing and being changed by the Lord? In their present state... They can stare till doomsday and not see it. Listen till they're blue in the face and not get it. Spiritually, we can have a deer in the headlight look. And, and, and we may have that in, in our heart where we're staring, but we're, we're, not, we're not responding. We're staring, but there's no pulse spiritually. And that's what Jesus says in terms of the principle of what can happen when His parable is spoken. We can take it. I don't want Isaiah's forecast. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. Forecast repeated all over again. Your ears are open, but you don't hear a thing. Your eyes are awake, but you don't see a thing. Look at this. The people are blockheads. <laughs> Not coneheads. Blockheads. I mean, they're just, okay, come on, come on, you know, get through that hard, hard skull, get through the hard heart, we got to peel away the, the callousness. 
But they're blockheads. Are you being a blockhead when it comes to Jesus? They stick their fingers in their ears so they don't want to have to listen. They don't want to listen. God's talking to us. Blah, 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 blah. Don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear that. Don't want to change that. Don't want to... Just tell me good things. But they, they stick their fingers in their ears so they won't listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look. So they won't have to deal with me face to face and let me heal them. God wants to heal every one of us because we're not the ones who are able to heal ourselves. God, God wants to heal us, can heal us if we let Him. And it, it requires humility. It requires a willingness. It requires giving up your pride. It requires putting yourself aside. Uh, it, it requires all those things and humbly approaching God and He will take care of you. But you have God-blessed eyes, eyes that see, and God-blessed ears, ears that hear. A lot of people, prophets and humble believers among them. We're talking Abraham. We're talking Moses. We're talking Joseph. We're talking King David. We're talking Ezekiel, Jeremiah, John the Baptist. All, all these people have longed to see and hear what we are privileged to have today. We have the Bible. We've got it in hard copy, in digital mode. It's in the cloud. It's in every hotel room. I mean, it's so accessible. We see the miracles of God happening and change lives today. There are a lot of people who have lived before us, our spiritual ancestors, who have longed to see and hear what we have today. Are you grateful for what God is giving you? Are you, are you grateful as a person in the availability of God's Word? A lot of people would love to trade places with you. Are you taking advantage of what God has given you? Are you taking church for granted? Are you taking your Bible for granted? Is it just sitting on your shelf collecting dust? Are you using it? Are you valuing it? Are you appreciating it? Are you studying the Bible? Are you giving your heart over to the Lord? There are a lot of people who wanted to trade places. And, and really, you know, the parables really expose our hearts. The people who really want to follow God, they'll want to know more about what the parables say. That's what the disciples did. They asked questions to Jesus and had Him explain these stories to them. They wanted to know. They had soft hearts. And there will be few people who want to do that. And sadly, many others won't even care about what Jesus says. And they will leave. They won't care. I hope, I hope all of us in this room are ones that will care. We will care, not just today, but long term. We will care about what Jesus says and gives us direction in our lives. I wanted to close up here and, and talk about what should we expect in studying the parables. Uh, I certainly haven't listed all the parables here at the moment. Uh, you're going to have to look them up. You're going to have to look them up. It's an easy search. But what should we expect in, in studying the parables over the next several weeks. Well, one area is we're going to learn about God and His heart for people, for us. Uh, Luke chapter 15, that's a, a passage we're going to go over this next week, has parables on the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. But we will, we will learn about God and His heart for us. Another thing we can expect in studying out the parables moving forward, we can learn about the nature of God's kingdom. He is king. And he has his spiritual kingdom. We're either a part of it or we're not. And so we find in Matthew 13 a few of the parables that talk about him being king and God's kingdom, the mustard seed, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price. We also learn the importance of personal responsibility. If we're going to be a member of God's kingdom, then we do have responsibility. God just doesn't do it all. It's a relationship. And God absolutely gives a tremendous amount to us, but He expects us to be active in our relationship with Him. And we see different parables that touch base on that. Uh, laborers in the vineyard, the talents, the persistent widow, the good Samaritan. We learn about personal responsibility from His parables. Also, we learn about the truth, and God's judgment on evil, and the rewards for righteousness. Jesus tells us there are consequences and there are benefits and rewards. 
to the choices all of us make in life. If we choose to not live for God, then there are consequences. There are absolutely consequences. Those are real, eternal consequences. But if we do choose to live for God, then there are rewards. There absolutely is, is reward for doing righteous things. And we learn about that in Matthew 25. The ten virgins, the great banquet, the unforgiving servant. Now, certainly this is just a, a small sampling of all the parables that are in the Bible. This is something you've got to be intrigued by and to look up. But whenever Jesus spoke about the kingdom, whenever he spoke about uh, him being king and the kingdom, there's a distinction that's being made. You're, you're either in the kingdom or you're not in the kingdom. And that's important for all of us to understand. You're either, you're either in the kingdom or you're out of the kingdom, according to Jesus. And you're in it if you obey the gospel and you repent. And you make decisions to change. And you get baptized. John chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. You're in the kingdom by obeying. You're, you're not in the kingdom by disobeying. And by obeying, you're, 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 you're out of the kingdom. And it's more than just the, the behavior of things. It has to do with our hearts. It has to do with our attitude and our mindset towards the Lord. And if you want to be part of the kingdom, then... You're going to have to make decisions to obey, to listen to God's Word, to listen to His parables. If you want to be in the kingdom for the first time or even come back into the kingdom, it's going to require you knowing and understanding the parables of Jesus. Because Jesus tells us how to be part of His kingdom. And He tells it through the stories. How should we study the parables? As, as we move forward. And I do want to recommend, uh, if you are learning the Bible for the first time, I want to recommend you, you study with other Christians that can help you learn and study and apply the Scriptures to your life. Uh, we, need all, we need coaching. We need mentoring in our lives. And the best, the best coaching that we can have in our lives is, is coaching that will affect us eternally. And I'm thankful that Tui read the children's version because that's how I started uh, as a senior in college. I read a, a Lion King version of the Bible. And it was just pictures. And that helped me. It was colored pictures. But that helped me. And we all have to start somewhere. Now, now many of you, you've graduated from that children's Bible. You look at me and you go, Anthony, you're so... God bless you. More power to you. <laughs> For some of you, you may be at that point where I need, I need something just real basic to get me started to help me. Right. And uh, trust me, the, the Bible is written on a third grade level. So you don't have to be smarter than a fifth grader. <laughs> you, you can understand it. It was, it was written for everyone. It was written for the common people of the world. God wants us to know Him and to understand them. And sometimes if we, if we don't have the coaching or the direction, we may not know, that, uh, that we just need help. We need help. How should we study? Here's some practicals, okay? Number one, just look them up. Look them up. Do a quick search. And uh, I want to encourage you to read a parable every day. Over the next several weeks, we'll be going through the parables of Christ and, and gleaning the teachings from His Word. Secondly, look for the context of these parables. Who is Jesus addressing? Who is it uh, towards? Who is it focused on? Because that can make a difference. Look for the central theme. There's at least one central theme in Jesus' story. He was, he, was, he was going to make a point. There was a point. I don't know if you ever saw that, that uh, animation movie, Finding Nemo, and the clownfish who was telling the joke to the sharks, and the sharks were waiting for a great joke, and there was no punchline. I recommend you see that after the war room. <laughs> Jesus always had a point in his parable for the central theme. And lastly, look to apply it. How, how does his principle apply to my life? Brothers and sisters, uh, let's get excited to study out Jesus' teachings. If you're ready, if you're open, if you've got a soft heart, these teachings are going to change your life. Give God the chance to minister to you. Give God the chance to change you, to be better for Him, to learn what opportunities He is giving you. 
Let's read the parables and let's honor Jesus in his words. Thank you very much. I appreciate our lesson this morning. And I think for me, I walked away with the part about preparing your heart. And the scripture I appreciated the most was verse 10 in Matthew 13. And this is the spirit I'm going to go after is the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? And the disciples, for all their flaws, had an incredible spirit to want to learn from Jesus. And my encouragement for us this morning over the next several weeks as we go through the red letters is that we go to Jesus first and ask him all kinds of questions you want to ask and allow God to move your hearts over the, over the next several weeks as we explore the parables. And so I want to thank Anthony for sharing this morning for us, preparing us, preparing our hearts for over the next several weeks. Uh, we have two closing announcements, and the first one is from Scott. Come on over.